you later. If you want to pop on the camera, you're more than welcome to. If you prefer to stay off, that's also great. Um, I'll share my screen, go through the presentation, and then we'll have a little discussion around it at the end. So I'm very excited to share this with you because it is something that um, is quite prominent and you know an, an issue, not just in your field, but I do have to say in every single workplace. So when we talk about how to get buy-in, how to speak their language, ultimately we are talking about the us versus them dynamic that we see across all different workplaces, across management levels, across departments. So know that you're not alone in this and I do understand just how frustrating that is. So let's try and eliminate some of that frustration for you. Oh, whoop. there we go. Um, to give you a little bit of background on who I am, just so you know kind of who the other person on you know, the other end of the screen is here. My title is business therapist because when I work with my clients, ultimately they take 10 minutes, unload everything from their day, and from that, I'm able to pick apart where the root cause of their stress is. It oftentimes isn't that, you know, Jane from marketing said something to you. It's that all of these things have compounded and now you've brought some stress from home, some stress from the workplace, and they're kind of interchangeable. So our work lives, especially right now, and our professional lives do tend to have a bit of a blurred line as much as we try to eliminate that. Um, and the name actually came as a bit of a joke from somebody who said, you know, oh, well, you deal with people's personal lives too. You're a bit of a, a bit of a business therapist and it's become a great talking point ever since. So that has been my title. My philosophy is very much people first. Um, when I deal with leaders, business owners specifically, I tell them that your people are the ones that drive your business. So if you're not listening to them, if you're not letting them weigh in, then ultimately that will not help you, you know, have your business be sustainable in the long run. Um, I have created the Spark Method, which is backed by 30 years of proven success. And, um, and so it is a series of self-assessments. And we'll be picking apart a little bit of that as we go through today. Not too much, but that is sort of what, what I base a lot of my teachings off of. And that with that, the result is to create permanent change. So when I'm giving you these tools and techniques, know that you know they are reminders. Um, they're reminders for everybody. It does take 21 days to form a habit. And oftentimes we do fall back into our regular pattern, our regular routine. So it is nice, whether it's myself, whether it's somebody else on the call to have that accountability buddy and just say, hey, remember when we were told that we should be doing this? I need you to give me a little nudge or a little poke every once in a while. Um, and a lot of this information is based off of different personalities. So we know that obviously there are many different personalities, many different people that exist in the workplace and we focus on specific distinct groups. Um, although with my teachings, I really try not to box people into something to say you are this personality or you are this personality. Because as you move through and transition from work to home, you do wear different hats. So if you want to look at it, for example, something like a giver taker dynamic, you might be more of a giver in the workplace and more of a taker at home. So I really try to keep that fluidity open so that you understand different personalities and how to interact with somebody who's the same as you and somebody who is different than you. The rest of that information you can find out another time. You don't need to know too much about me. So let's get into the, the meat and potatoes of this. Um, I essentially help people find their SPARK. So SPARK stands for security, praise, acknowledgement, respect, and knowledge. And it's the five pillars of human desire that drive our motivation. So when we're looking at different people in the workplace, we work through SPARK what that means and how secure you feel, how much praise you feel you're getting, whether you feel acknowledged in the workplace. And so really today we're gonna to be focusing on acknowledgement because that's where buy-in comes from. We really wanna make sure that we're being heard, we're being seen and our opinions are being taken seriously. And once you find your spark, it will give you insight into who you are as a leader, but not just a leader, whether you are a spouse, a friend, a son, a daughter, whatever it might be. Um, it also sheds light on the way that you are perceived by those around you. So while we will be focusing on how to essentially manage up um, and to also help our managers manage up even still, there are some elements and some components that we might also play a part in when it comes to this communication. Remember that communication is always a two-way street and self-reflection is always so important when it comes to understanding why there might be miscommunications or why we're not being heard appropriately. Um, it'll also help you understand why you might have some relationships that have more friction than others. 
and really give you the confidence to be able to have those difficult situations or conversations, walk into a boardroom and say, this is what I need. This is why we should do this. And I'm so confident in that because at the end of the day, you are all experts in your field. You know this. And so I really want to drive that home that your opinion should be heard because you are the experts. And so when we see this us versus them mentality, it really boils down to two things. The main thing is the idea of assumptions. Everybody assumes that somebody else is doing something or not doing something um, that other people know what we know as well, which is a huge assumption that causes a lot of miscommunications and people to miss the mark. So an assumption would be something like, she owns the company and it's doing really well. She must be rolling in money. Or, you know, well, I don't see Donna in the office that often. So is she really working? Meanwhile, Donna works around the clock to get projects done, but nobody is aware of that because you only see a snapshot of somebody's day. And so this is where this us versus them mentality really, really comes into play because people just aren't taking the time to understand the other people that we work with. It's the unfortunate reality. And so now as we go through this, we're basing what the, the process that I'll teach you right now off of perceptions, which are things that are rooted in a little bit more fact. Of course, you don't know everything about somebody's life. You don't know everything about the expectations that they have, the pressure that they're under, the things that are going on at home as well. We have to take that into consideration when we think about our colleagues, especially now more so than ever. But we're looking at the perception, so things that we can root in fact. And then we're going to take those facts and we're going to leverage those and use those to our advantage. So there are two models of assumption that I really work with teams on. Uh, the first is obviously the departmental. So you have something like, and I've used UXers, whether it's designers, project managers, this could be really whatever. Um, but you have the, the two on opposing ends and then you have somebody smack dab in the middle. So this person in the middle, perhaps it's marketing, is stuck in a bit of a vice because they're getting input from both, opinions from both with two different sets of expertise, two different vantage points on the same project. So if you have ever been snapped at by somebody who is in that middle position, um, perhaps you have been in that middle position and you find yourself really firing off, you know, the out of stress and out of anger and people are coming at you, they're asking for things, they're demanding things, and you just find sometimes that you have a hard time controlling your stress and your reactions. Think about the position that you're in, show yourself a little bit of grace, but also understand that perhaps we need to look at that stress management because it is something that is very, very prominent. And the best thing that I can recommend in this situation, in this position is just to take one deep breath, take a step back and wait before you react. But that's not what's going to get you buy-in. So that's just a little tip that I wanted to give you. There we go. Um, the next model of assumption that we really need to pay attention to is the managerial model of assumption. So we're looking at senior management, mid-level management, and then the department experts as well. So where do you fit into that? Who are you reporting to? Who's your direct report? And what is the buy-in that they need to get from somebody else? This is also incredibly difficult if you are somebody that has two layers to get through because at the senior management level, it is difficult for them to have line of sight of what's going on with projects, with things on the ground level. So again, that mid-level manager is sort of trapped in a vice, not excusing their behavior. It just means that there may be other pressures that we're not totally privy to. So I wanna give you a little bit of a case study. Um, this is a proven success story, and this is the the methodology that I use with my clients, but I wanted to show you how we can change our perception, how we can work through to get the buy-in that we want with people that we don't even really know. Um, there is a bit of a different context with this, but then we're going to bring it full circle and apply it to your industry. So this for privacy sake isn't Trish, but we're going to say it's Trish. Um, and when we met, Trish was a senior manager and she was in for a smaller division of a larger department. So she was a senior manager of a smaller team within a big department and she was at her wits end. She couldn't get buy-in to really um, help her team get the things that they wanted. So she was coming at it from obviously a team perspective. If you wanna translate that to more of a user perspective, right? She was trying to get in the buy-in for her team and or users, clients. And 
She was also being underpaid, felt like she was undervalued, wasn't being heard, couldn't get a word in edgewise with any kind of management. So she came to me and she said, I'm at my wit's end. I need some of this leadership training because I need to be able to go to a new job and say, here are my skills. I can lead a team. This is the salary I'm looking for. Or I need a promotion in this company, but I can't stay where I am. It's just not going to fly. When we met, she had absolutely no rapport with the senior management team or C-suite management team at all. She reported directly to a director who was very much overworked herself, and she was looking for buy-in consistently in order to keep the team happy. She had three different uh, members of her team who were looking elsewhere, who were looking to leave because simple asks like vacation time or even just, you know, we have too much on our plates. We need these resources and this software in order to do our job efficiently. They couldn't get the funding for that. Nobody would even hear them out. So at this point, everybody was just looking for new jobs, ready to jump ship, and that would have been pretty much an overhaul of their entire department. So within four weeks, Trish was being considered for a promotion within the same company, the promotion that she wanted to manager of the entire department, um, alongside four others. She had her team and colleagues advocating for her to this director and also to senior management, and she was gearing up for the interview process. So at four weeks, she had her asks, her proposal ready, and it was all the things that she wanted to push forward for her team. That was how her, those are going to be her key focuses for her new position and, and her kind of legacy in this role. The interview was set up with the VP of the company, who she had absolutely no interactions with, and her direct reporting manager. Within 10 weeks, she had the interview. She went to the interview with the VP and the director and she really caught the director's attention. He, she made some points and he said, those are very astute observations and your numbers are actually spot on. I wasn't expecting to see this from you because I know what your asks are. She was offered the promotion very shortly thereafter and then she negotiated her salary right on the spot. With that, she also got the buy-in from the management team to use the software that they wanted to be able to give their staff, whether it was compromised on additional vacation, tiny raises, whatever it might be, everybody was content with what they received from management. And she, was, she felt fantastic as a leader, obviously. She had that confidence to be able to go in. When we first started working together, she was not. She felt that she, you know, emails she sent out were juvenile. She felt like she didn't have the confidence. She felt like she wasn't the expert and she was, quite honestly, nervous to have these conversations with the people that put the pant, their pants on the exact same way that we do. So how did she do this? Well, she learned how to speak their language and I'm gonna walk you through the exact process that she used. First, we determined who Trish was as a leader because if you're looking to constantly analyze how somebody else communicates, the most important thing you can do is first analyze how you communicate because perhaps Obviously, when you know how you communicate, you can see the discrepancies in the way that they communicate as well and start to bridge that gap. So we looked at how does she interpret information, right? Is she more visual? Is she more auditory? Um, what, what methods and modes does she use? And then what does she prefer to, to send information out to her team using? Is it that she writes emails? Is it that she prefers to pick up the phone and give them a call? So knowing this immediately just helped us to identify that she was very much a visual person. She liked to send emails. She could get all the details out. Fantastic. How does she communicate? Is she direct and to the point? Is she concise? Does she like to tell stories? Does she add a little bit more fluff? Does she need all the details? How is she communicating? And how are these people that she's reaching communicating? How well does she manage her emotions? That was the, one of the biggest things that we needed to work on was that if somebody didn't give her the answer that she wanted, she was immediately on the defense. And she said, I actually started to sit in meetings and check my tone. And she said, I didn't realize how big my eye roll, eye roll was until we started going through how well I manage my emotions. Somebody said something that wasn't satisfactory. She would sit there and do a massive eye roll. And it wasn't, it just was subconscious. She didn't even realize she was doing it. So it was being aware of how she was coming off with her nonverbal cues that really helped us to keep her composure while she was asking for the things that she wanted. 
And then what does she know that the other people don't know? What is she an expert in? Because a lot of people, we assume that they know what we know and vice versa. They assume that we know what they know. So once we're able to identify the things that we can really use as leverage points and say, I'm an expert in this, this is why you should listen to my opinion, then we have a lot more, um, we have a lot more leverage when it comes to negotiating and getting that buy-in really. Next, we analyzed her audience. And this is one of my favorite activities to do with anybody, whether it's a friend, whether it's a colleague, whether it's going for a promotion, having any sort of difficult conversation, I always take a piece of paper, I write down their name, I write down what the conversation is about, and I write down their position. And then I write all of the facts, hard facts that I know about that person. What do they like? What kind of language do they use? Are they you know, a little bit more lax with their grammar or are they very grammatically correct? We wanna know all these pieces about the people that we're interacting with so that we can mirror them, we can mirror their behavior. So in Trish's instance, she was trying to get buy-in from the vice president of the company. He focused on operations. He talked about financials 90% of the time because that's where his focus lay in the company. He had the pressure of overseeing middle management while also keeping stakeholders happy. And he had the CEO, the pressures from a new CEO changing policies. So she was also breathing down his neck a little bit. He also rarely spent time with the team, which was why Trish didn't know him at all. So he had no line of sight of what was going on really on the day to day. He was quite elusive. So that was the picture. We painted that picture for him. Next, her direct reporting manager. She had the responsibility of the previous manager fall onto her. So now she was doing the work of two people. She was visibly stressed and overwhelmed. Anytime Trish would come in and ask a question, she would say, I just, I just don't have the time for this right now. Um, you know, I'll have to get to this later. I'm so sorry. So Trish started taking bit by bit things off of her plate. She would go in and check on her sometimes and just say, hey, I know you're stressed. I know you got a lot going on. Can I make you tea? Y'all good? Do you need to talk about anything? Right? So she just tried to empathize with her and be a little more compassionate to the situation. And this direct manager, this director reported directly to the VP as well. After we had made our lists, we knew exactly what these people were about. We reframed her points in their terms. So we really started to speak their language where she would have led with something that was about the people that was compassionate that was really focused on, you know, these people are going to leave. If you don't do something right now, you're going to lose your team. Well, that's wonderful, right? The VP sitting there saying, we'll just hire somebody else. If they want to leave so badly, they can leave. But instead of leading that way, right, with the, the kind of heart-centered focus, we reframed it. So we really outlined the positions or the responsibilities that she had already absorbed in her new position or in her current position that would have been for the new position. And then she spoke directly to her director, her immediate report, and just said, this would be a seamless transition. I've already absorbed a lot of these responsibilities. So you would need to spend less time training me if I were to take this position, if I were to advance and move up. Next, she looked, starts talking about the, the changes that she had already made, the successful changes that she had already implemented with the team. You know, we send out this newsletter now. We, um, we have team meetings. We are all working together on X, Y, and Z harmoniously. So these are the changes that she'd already implemented to be able to provide the proof to say, this is why I can really do this job. And then she compared, this was the biggest piece. She compared the cost of the team's asks to the cost of the turnover of leaving, of having those team members leave. And it was at this point that the VP really sat up and took notice and he said, wow, how did you calculate that amount so efficiently and so well? Because immediately she caught his attention. Numbers, finances, we're losing money. We would be losing more money if our people left rather than giving them what they want. Now there's a discrepancy. Now there was some kind of bargaining and negotiating power. And then she also came prepared for herself with industry standard salaries to say, it's not just my opinion. This is rooted in fact. This is why I'm deserving of this. These are the industry standards. This is something that is universal. So she also had that proof to back her points. So now 
with that being said, that's how Trish was able to get her buy-in. I want to turn this on all of you and we're going to go through what that would look like for you. So who are you? How do you interpret information? How do you communicate? How well do you manage your emotions on a scale of one to 10? Do you find yourself getting stressed out easily? Do you notice when you react out of heightened emotion, both positive and negative? How do you express yourself through nonverbal cues when you're sitting in a meeting? Are you sitting with your arms crossed? Are you looking disengaged? Um, when you're having a conversation with somebody, are you facing them? What are your facial expressions doing, right? These are all pieces that really help to get you buy-in more so than you think. About 70% is, is body language when we're talking to somebody. So it's massive to really be aware of those things and to self-reflect. And then what do you know that others don't? What area are you an expert in, right? We are always, you're talking about getting this buy-in and you, you don't want to offend any kind of anybody else and step on their toes. But at the end of the day, you are very well versed in what you do. This is your expert opinion and you are there for a reason. So make sure that that's heard. We really want to emphasize that. And a general kind of overview. And I mean, let's have a discussion about this, but the nature of designers, right? You're, you have a very inquisitive nature. You have the ability to reframe that perspective. You're analytical. You're also creative, which is a wonderful, wonderful mix. You have a keen eye for design. Some would say you're solution architects because you're constantly having to pivot, having to premeditate and predict any potential errors or issues that might pop up and you're proactive, right? And then what are your main objectives when it comes to a project or when you're trying to get this buy-in? You really wanna make sure that for the integrity of the project, you're premeditating any flaws, which is why you want the buy-in to do additional research to make sure that everything is flushed out and working properly. You wanna provide the most seamless client experience possible, which at the end of the day then retains your clients. You want to intuitively guide the client from to the point of purchase, obviously, and beyond, which requires a ton of research. And you need to be able to iterate as quickly as possible as necessary. So if somebody were to sit back and to assess you as a whole, in general, would you say that those are fair assumptions or perceptions? Any thumbs up? I can't see too many people. Or any any chats? Any uh, any comments? Thumbs up, Kim. Thank you. Okay. Very good. All right. Awesome. Do we have we have some chats? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. See. I'm going to get you talking. I told you. <laughs> all right. Um, and I actually came across this, which I'm sure you are all very well versed in. The Disney 10 UX commandments applied. Well, and then I applied it to workplace dynamics because we're really working through exactly what it is that you do every day. You know your audience. You wear your guest shoes, right? You get into their shoes. I want you to do the exact same thing with the people you're trying to get buy-in for or from, I should say, right? I just really love these 10. I think that they're applicable, fun little, a fun little industry uh, to resonate with the industry. But um, now let's look at, since we've looked at who you are, obviously that takes some deeper self-assessment, but next we wanna analyze your audience. So who are you typically trying to get buy-in from? You're looking at product managers, you're looking at marketing managers, and you're looking at C-suite managers, right? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So if you want to do a little exercise while we're doing this, we are going to go through, have some more slides, but if you want to write out a couple of notes too, you can start to write out the facts or the perceptions that you have about these different people. If I miss anything on the next few slides. So how do they communicate? These people that you're trying to analyze or assess, are they direct and to the point? Do they prefer to have all the details? I can tell you right now that most people that are in the C-suite position, it's short, it's quick, it's concise, it's to the point, it's black and white. If you have somebody who's in marketing, they're a little more gray. They want some more of the details. You need to paint that picture for them. If you try and paint that picture to somebody who's in a C-suite position, they're gonna say, I don't, I don't have the time for this. I need you to give me the main points. If you try to do the opposite to marketing, they'll say, that's not, 
I, I don't, I can't picture what you're saying. I'm, I need a visual. You need to give me something else. I need a little bit more of this creative, like what, why are we doing this? Give me the why, right? What is this person's focus within the organization? Are they focused on client satisfaction? Are they focused on operations? Are they focused on the finances and the overall financial viability of the business? Right? So that's how we really get into speaking their language. What is this person's focus? How am I reframing what I need to say in order to meet their needs? And finally, who do they report to and who reports to them? How many people are in their direct report circle? How many different opinions do they have coming to them? How likely is it that you're going to be able to schedule a meeting with them tomorrow versus needing to book a meeting two weeks out? These are all things that need to, we need to take into account and consideration. It does require a little bit more work on your part, but at the end of the day, once you get people into the pattern of knowing how you operate and getting that first buy-in, it'll become easier and easier and easier because you're gaining that trust and building that rapport. So a little example of something that we do in the SPARK method with in the knowledge pillar, we go through a self-assessment to look at our black and white personalities and our gray personalities. So black and white, as I mentioned, they're very direct and concise. They move quickly to somebody who is a gray personality. They might come off as a little abrupt and rude, but they're just already on to the next topic, not necessarily meaning that. Um, and if you are a black and white personality, you need to make sure that you are leading a conversation with, I don't have too much time. I love that you elaborate and give me all the details, but right now I just need the Coles notes and I'll catch up with the details later. So you're not interrupting somebody mid-sentence. You're not stopping them when they're in the middle of a story or in the middle of trying to give you something, making them feel devalued, making them feel like they're not being heard and you don't care about what they have to say. Preface that and immediately that gives somebody the opportunity to say, okay, I need to summarize. I need to give you the high level summary, the 30,000 level foot visual of what I need to tell you. For my gray personalities, you require every detail and we'll also share every detail. You're the storytellers, which is wonderful. Um, you need to be very specific when you're asking for details from people. I always say, do the five W's, who, what, where, when, why, and then obviously add in how. Um, you can get easily sidetracked. And to somebody who's black and white, you might come off a little scatterbrained because you are painting this picture. Everything comes full circle, but they've tuned out after the first two, two sentences because their attention span doesn't match yours. It's not that they're not engaged with your story. It's just that they have 30 seconds or three seconds and they, you know, they're already on to the next thing. They need the point to be made in the first few sentences. Um, and then when you're dealing with black and white, remember to just have scannable information. If you're sending an email, you need to put in a lot of detail, highlight and underline the key points so that they can scan through almost like speed reading. If they only read those highlighted points, what will they be able to take away? Will they get all of the key pertinent information? And then the rest can kind of, they can go through when they have more time, right? So just making sure that you're really catering to each of those personalities and identifying which one you are so that you can obviously notice those discrepancies. And then you want to wear their shoes or put yourself in their shoes. Um, do you know about their objectives, right? These people that you're trying to get buy-in from. Do you know whether their objective is a successful rollout of the product or service? Is it the quickest way to get it to market? Um, and they're also there trying to get deliverables from all of the different departments in a timely manner, which you are as well, right? Everybody's just trying to get things from other people. And so being able to communicate with them in a way that resonates with them, that has them saying, okay, that's exactly what you need. You've perked my ears up. Here's the objective that we're both going for. Now you're getting that by and you're getting things from them right away. And what are their pressures as well? So is it expectations from senior management? Is it budget constraints? Is it time constraints? Is it opinions from multiple different departments? What is the main pressure that they're facing right now? The main stressor, because we can also use that to our advantage to leverage your point. And then we turn it, we reframe your perspective. So what are the benefits to them if they take your recommendations? At the end of the day, everybody wants to, be, to benefit from something. So if I say, this will make your life easier, here's how. Not, this will be easier for the company, this will be easier for this, this will make your life less stressful. Here's what I'm gonna do to make that happen, 
right? Immediately you have the buy-in from that person. Um, and then are you presenting these in their terms or your terms? Because a lot of the time we say, well, it's because I know that this will be best for the project and this and that, but nope, we want to say this will be best for you. And then what are the consequences of not having ample time to do these iterative, iterative studies that you've talked about or to get all of that research? What's the cost of losing loyal clients versus taking the time to do the initial research? And so this requires a little bit of obviously calculating. Um, you wanna look at what that additional research time would look like in a dollar amount if you're dealing with somebody who is a financially based decision maker. You want to say this many hours, this many people, this many staff, here's how much it will cost you. If you're losing loyal clients, we know the 80-20 rule, right? That 80% of our revenue comes from 20% of our clients. So if we're losing a loyal client, how much does that cost? How much will it cost it, us to gain a new client to keep them loyal, to have them go through this process again? Are you balancing that out? Where are they losing more money? If you put it in those terms, I guarantee they'll go with the one that obviously they're, they're saving money with. That's what we want. It might take a little bit of extra time, but at the end of the day, we can save money. And that's what a lot of organizations will naturally opt for, unfortunately. So speak their language. Make sure you are putting things in their terms. Make sure that you are knowing who exactly who you're talking to. And then also look to empathize with the situation. Much like we would like empathy, you're under a lot of stress. You have so much going on. You're trying to get this buy-in. I understand how frustrating it is to constantly be pushing your point forward, pushing your point forward, and just not having your needs met and just saying, why do I even try? Because nobody's hearing me. Just make sure you're speaking their language. Take a deep breath. You will get it. You know exactly what you're talking about. It's not your knowledge. It's the fact that people are only listening to the things that they need to hear. They're listening to the things that will resonate with them. Something that just catches their attention, perks their ears up because it's benefiting them, right? That's, that is the nature of, of humans and human behavior. We really do look at the things that are benefiting us. Um, and then when we go into these conversations, I really want you to be cognizant of how you're approaching the conversation. Is it competitive or is it collaborative? I can guarantee from all of your smiling faces that most of you are coming in in a collaborative nature, right? You want what's best for the entire project. You want what's best for the team. You want to come in and make sure that everything is a success for the collective. So make sure you're, you're voicing that and you're vocalizing that and saying, this isn't about whether I'm right or wrong. This is about the studies that I have that prove that if we have a little bit more research, we won't have to go back. We won't have to spend additional time on changing and iterating and doing this entire process again. We won't lose money because our clients and our customers will be happy the first time around if we just take a little bit more time. And by a little bit more time, you wanna make sure that you're being very specific with that. You need to give them all the details in the first meeting, making sure that everything is laid out clear and concise. Here's the plan of action. Here's how many, how many days, weeks, months we need. Here's why we need it. Here's the money we're saving. And this is how we're going to do it. I've laid it all out. Immediately that person will say, whoa, okay. What do I need to do here? You just need to approve it. You need to give me the go ahead. And then you move forward. When you come in saying, you know, well, this is my opinion. I really think we should do this. And, um, you know, I know that this is what we need to do. A lot of people will say, well, I know that we don't. So that can be easily be, um, easily be countered. So you want to make sure that you are coming in in the best interest of the company. And sometimes it's not the most fun to have to say these things and to just say, yep, I know, you know, I, I empathize with your situation. I know you have a lot going on and a lot on your plate, but I want to tell you a little story. And I was working in senior management with an entire male management team, which was wonderful um, as a project manager. And every single week for every single event, I would have to go to every single one of these individuals and ask for something. And when I first started, I was met with a lot of hesitancy. You know, I don't have the time for this. I'm too busy. I'm too this. I don't, I don't have this. I don't like that. I don't want to do it. 
And so I sat back for a couple of days and well, I say days, it was actually weeks. And I studied and analyzed each individual person. And from that, I knew that the chef loved to be told that he was, I knew he was very busy. I knew he had a lot on his plate. I just needed five minutes. As soon as I'd walk in and I'd say, I know you're so busy. Can I just have five minutes? Immediately he would say yes. Somebody else would come in, another colleague and say, I know you're busy. I'm busy too. I just need five minutes. Well, that put him on the defense because it wasn't necessarily stroking his ego. And you see this, it, this isn't just confined to mail management. This is to, to really anybody when you're speaking their language, right? Somebody else knew that, um, knew that he needed to have the final call and it needed to be his decision. So I would give, I would give two decisions, two ideas. And I would say, which do you think we should go with? What do you think is the best decision? Obviously making one more attractive than the other. And he would always choose the one that I wanted him to, because I framed it in a way that made it seem like that one was the most appealing, most attractive, but it gave him final say in him that decision. So he agreed with whatever it was that I wanted. So it's learning the, the language and the style of each individual person to be able to make your life much easier. So when we're doing these things, you really want to use different terms and communication is something that can easily be tweaked to really resonate with the people that, you know, you're, you're interacting with daily. And again, you can use this not just in a professional sense, but also in a pers personal capacity. Um, so I understand that. I can appreciate that you're really busy. I would really just love five minutes of your time. That's all. Um, I can only imagine the pressure that you're under right now. I know that you have many different direct reports and you also you know, have senior management breathing down your neck about this. So I understand the pressure you're under. I wanna to help to try and alleviate some of that. I think I have a solution. Immediately doors will open. How can you eliminate this pressure for me? Um, my suggestions are in the best interest of the project. From my past experience, showing that you do have obviously that knowledge that you're bringing forward. Is there a way that we can compromise on this? showing that you're open to having the discussion. And then also saying, you know, here's the proof. I have proof from this study. I have proof from this business who has done something very similar, which I assume that you do in, in your research now as well. So to summarize a little bit, because I really wanna get into question and answer. And if you have any situations, we can work through them um, and to really have discussion about this, but you need to assess your own communication style first and foremost then you need to get out a piece of paper and analyze your decision maker, figure out exactly who they are, what they're about, what their language is. You need to reframe your perspective. So just tweak that communication a little bit. So you're using terms that will really perk their ears up, speak their language when you go into having that conversation, making sure you know, you're know you going with confident body language, you're looking them, they, looking them in the eyes and um, your body language is saying, I'm here, I have an opinion and uh, you need to listen to it because it's valid and it's only going to help us. And then approach the situation with a collaborative attitude. And before we get into 